Hello, everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. In 2015, more than 33,000 people in the United States died of a heroin or opioid overdose. 82% were white and 8% were black and Hispanic, re respectively. The Trump administration called for a special commission to determine how to deal with the epidemic, and law enforcement encourages addicts to turn themselves in with no fear of arrest, but instead help to kick the habit. So why is it that when a white person who becomes addicted has a medical problem, while a black or brown person has a criminal problem? Disparity in addiction treatment. We'll talk about it next on Another View on Health. So stay tuned. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. According to the 2015 National Survey on Drug Use and Health, African-Americans and whites use drugs at similar rates, but blacks are imprisoned for drug charges at a rate six times that of whites. In fact, African-Americans make up 12.5% of illicit drug users, but 29% of those arrested for drug offenses and 33% of those incarcerated for drug offenses. That's the results of the war on drugs started four decades ago by President Nixon. Today, there is a crisis in heroin and prescri pre prescription drug addiction and overdose, and it's hitting the white community, particularly in small towns and rural areas. It has reached what they call epidemic proportions and is a medical crisis. Why the disparity? Uh, Georgetown University sociology professor and author Michael Eric Dyson summed it up this way, quote, White brothers and sisters have been medicalized in terms of their trauma and addiction. Black and brown people have been criminalized for their trauma and addiction, unquote. So where are we on this crisis in Hampton Roads? Joining us to talk about it is Mr. Tony Crisp, Director of Addiction and Recovery Treatment Services with the Hampton Newport News Community Services Board. Hi, Tony. How are you? All right. Good. Thanks so much for joining us mm -hmm. today. We appreciate it. Joe, who is a recovering addict. Hi, Joe. How you doing? Hello. Good. Glad to have you with us today. And our favorite cardiologist and my co-host <laughs> for Another View on Health, Dr. Keith Newby. How you doing, Keith? I'm doing fine. And yourself? <laughs> Good. I'm doing just great. Always so, a pleasure. Tony, let me start with you. What do you think about Michael Eric Dyson's quote that the um, white population has been medicalized in terms of trauma and addiction and the black and brown population criminalized? I think he's on target. I mean, first, there, we've learned a lot in, in many years that we know that now the addictions are a disease. But it's still when we knew that it was still that for black and brown people, it was for criminal justice issue, mm -hmm. but nowadays it's more medicalized. So I think he's really on target. I think he's right on target yeah. for that. Mm -hmm. So, Joe, I want to hear your story first. We kind of get us thinking about all of the other issues that we're going to talk talk about. So you had an addiction. You were in recovery. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Can you tell us what happened? What were you addicted to? When did it start? Uh, it started, I started using the first time I was about seven years old. Wow. wow. And yes. you started using what? The marijuana. Marijuana. Yes. Okay. And it, it progressed. After a while, the marijuana wouldn't do what I was looking for. It wouldn't cover up the pain. Mm -hmm. the, I couldn't escape with that anymore. So it moved to sniffing powder, cocaine, and then it went to, it progressed to crack. Mm -hmm. And after a while, that I didn't like the way that made me feel. I don't know, my body changed or whatever. And... I went to a downer, which was heroin, and I fell in love with it. Really? Yes. And so when you say you fell in love with it, what, what did it do for you? What Can you put in words kind of how it made you feel? It was everything. Wow. It was my mother, my father, my girlfriend, my best friend. It was the love of my life. And how often did you have to shoot up? Daily. Or did you? I, let me, let me it not, started. Okay, it started with, a sniffing? Yes, ma'am. And... Over a period of time, you, your body gets, your tolerance grows and it gets so high, it goes from doing two bags to a bundle, which is 10 bags. Mm -hmm. And you don't need as much if you IV use. Uh -huh. So it's cheaper. It's a cheaper process. So now I'm back to two bags. Mm -hmm. But over a period of three or four months, the 
two bags go to a half a gram at a time. And that's maybe four or five times a day. Four or five times a day. You have to be a mathematician, right? <laughs> yes, I was going to say, just to figure out what, what, what the deal is. Go ahead, so, Keith. Joe, just out of curiosity, seven years old, most seven-year-olds are going to be watching cartoons and doing, going to school, what have you. How did you get exposed to this, to use marijuana, at seven years old? My neighborhood. Okay. The environment. I mean, so people just like just hand you a joint to say hit this. You're out on the yeah. corner. Uh-huh. We played football out in the street. Yeah. We hung out on the corner. That was our safe zone. Okay. So the older kids were out there doing it, and they thought it was, I guess, cute, cute you know, to yeah. let us try it, and I loved it. Wow. Mm. Did your did your parents? Did your home life was was there anyone who tried to keep you? Off of it? You can oh, hide it. it. I hid it for a while, but I have older I have older siblings and they found out what at the time I was maybe twelve then when they noticed it and once or twice they were using. Mm. They didn't have a problem with it. You know, it was recreational for them. So Ah. You but know, you became it, addicted. Right. It it was kinda accepted. I want to ask one other question before I come to you about the whole addiction process. But so you said that that you were at, at a bundle, um, and then it was cheaper to do it intravenously. How much money are we talking about on a daily basis? Mm-hmm. In the beginning, fifty dollars a day. In the end, three four hundred a day. A day. Were you functioning? I mean, in other words, did you have a job? Were you working? Were you, you know, family? Were you doing all the, the other functional things in life? Or, or were you just always focused on trying to get high? The main objective was to get high. Nothing else mattered. I had those things, and they slowly faded away, of course, mm-hmm. because I neglected them. Mm-hmm. But getting high was first and foremost. Mm-hmm. I don't care what was going on, you know. So what made you change? Um, I've been through this process before, and I have accumulated some things. I was a business owner, and I went through a divorce and lost my mother in the process. Mm-hmm. And I lost focus on myself, and I was didn't want to feel that pain. So I reverted back to what I knew Mm -hmm. and started doing other things that I knew, reaching out to people and fellowshipping. I I, I belong to another fellowship, you know, and um, I knew the things to do. I just didn't. I didn't do them. You just didn't do them. 440-2665 Four four zero two six six five or one eight hundred nine four zero two two four zero are the numbers to call. We were talking about the um, opioid um, addiction and all of the things that are associated with this new look or different look at addiction, looking at it from a medical perspective as opposed to a criminal perspective, which is what our community has experienced. So, Tony, when you when you hear Joe's story, when you hear other stories, people that you you deal with um, in my research, it feels like there aren't a lot of African-Americans that are really hooked on the opioids, that it's a it's a different issue. For them, is that correct, or is that just kind of the way people want to portray things now that more white people are experiencing this addiction? Well, the opioid addiction has always been a problem in the black community, but in, if you look at it from a percentage standpoint, it's more white people are addicted to the opioid than than African Americans. Mm-hmm. I mean, even with at Hampton Newport News Community Services Board, in our methadone cl- uh, program and as well as our OBOX program, we just started it. We serve about twenty eight percent. 28% of those folks are African American. Okay. The greater extent of people of of, of, of white folks. So. What's what is Obox? Obox is a new medication where you can well it's not really new but it's it's suboxone. So in sort of again this is medical medicalizing the the whole epidemic. Mm-hmm. Methadone people are very familiar with methadone when you come every day to get your medication in addition to psychosocial counseling services. 
But the issue is the portrayal is that sometimes there's they have what you call um, uh, medication hours where you see a, a line of people. Uh. And so that's a bad start. You see a line of people for like the first two hours. So they want to take medication every day. With Old Box, it's called Office Space uh, Opioid Services, where you can go into a doctor's office. In our case, we have an office where the doctor will see you, give you a medication, write your pres- prescription, and you can get your prescription filled in a pharmacy. You still have to involve, involve in counseling, but you don't have sure. to come every day. The regulations are different. So, again, it's normalizing that whole process. And so this is another way to get people to say to come in and that it's like any other um, disease that, you know, you may need medication, but it's something that you can, it, it's more confidential. It you takes can, away the stereotype. It takes too. away the stereotype, mm-hmm. yeah. So you don't have the, the long lines yeah. outside right. um, and so forth. So you've been in this business for a while. Right? Yes, <laughs> very long time. <laughs> I mean, what what do you think about the disparity in the way that people are treated in terms of what is clearly a medical problem? Is that it is a medical problem? It, it is a medical the problem. Addiction. It, it, it's not addiction. the selling. Yeah, We're not it, talking about yeah. the selling and, yeah. and distribution, but the addiction is a yeah. medical problem. Yeah, it, it's a medical problem. It, it, and my concern is, uh, unfortunately, many African Americans. There's many of them that live in a, a low income, or if especially in inner city neighborhood. And so, um, uh, when you don't have money, when you're, there's a lot of health disparity, and you can't get the things that you see other people, and so that's one thing to, to run to is drugs and alcohol, you mm-hmm. know, those kind of things like that. I, I grew up in a rural area, and that was not a alcohol was a problem, it was not things like cocaine and heroin was a problem but when I moved over here that was the main problem and I saw that especially at the heart of the cocaine addiction crack cocaine how uh, really the federal government as well as the criminal justice system it was a a black problem and uh, women lost their kids Mm -hmm. Uh, the the males went to jail Um, and so those are It's so different now. So I'm glad. So on one hand, because the face of addiction has changed, I think it's in many ways uh, it's going to be better for everyone. Well, that's a really good point. I was going to ask you. So now that things are changing, the perceptions are changing, do you think that more people of color who have an addiction problem – actually be able to get the help they need i will hope so the problem is we got to find a way to get them out uh, get the message out there that it's okay you know we're doing things like uh the newspaper article we're doing tv articles doing things like this Mm -hmm. but how do we get the message out for those folks in those inner cities in those neighborhoods to to let them know that this is a new way to come and get into treatment and uh, folks like joe will help that because he you know he he runs with a circle of folks that i don't run with and you don't run with Mm -hmm. so we got to get the message out in so many different ways but yes we're trying to expand that uh through our peer counselors uh through being in different parts of the neighborhood to get that message out so they can come into treatment so joe how do how then do you get people to trust that one that they probably be better off if they could overcome the addiction because i think maybe deep down inside they may know that or not or is this drug just so powerful that that at when you're in it you're in it it it's a disease so it's treated like every other disease and the the trust is is kind of hard when you're in that lifestyle you learn not to trust no one can't even trust yourself so it, i think it's kind of like attraction mm-hmm. you know it my circle that you surround with me see me now and they want what i have it's attraction to them mm-hmm. so and i talk to a lot of people i reach out to people you know i sympathize with people because i i see myself in them you know because it wasn't long ago that was me out there so i do what i can the kids in the community or people that I that I know that are still in active addiction, I reach out to them. There are one of the things that um, I think as a physician that we run into is, you know, you have almost like different groups of people who are using these types of drugs. Uh, you have a group that may be in the street more, and they 
is they're looked at one way. But then you got this subtle group that we have to deal with who come in with these problems they're calling legitimate back pain, leg pain, you know, chronic pain issues. Mm -hmm. And they are harder, to be honest with you, to deal with because Mm -hmm. Joe may recognize there's a problem. They don't. They justify their use based on their chronic pain issues. So, you know, and we've had people even in our clinic that come in and get very indignant when you're trying to tell them you're not going to prescribe these drugs for them. I mean, I'm talking like almost to the point of being violent uh, because of that. That just goes to show how addicting this is. And, you know, that is the dilemma we as physicians have. So, Keith and and Tony, both of you can, can answer this, but what does it physically do to your body that makes you have to take this drug every single day well, you- it's how it you know and i and of course i had to go back to old pharmacology 101 <laughs> from medical school <laughs> I, you know i don't remember the dynamics but it, i know it's 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 the euphoric effect that it has in the brain but there's this i tell you what, what you run into is and i do remember this part is you know that achievement of the goal that they're looking for in terms of how it makes you feel continues to rise as they continue to use it. So, in other words, say at one point in time it may take, and I'm just throwing numbers out, like five milligrams of a drug to achieve the effect. The problem is over time you start to build intolerance, and then it takes more. more and more. But the problem is is that the um, the lethal dose doesn't change. So it's like, you know, you and, and the dose to achieve the effect continues to rise. So you have the dose where you consider overdosing and the, uh, the dose to achieve the effect that you're looking for continues to rise. And then they, all of a sudden they even out. And then you get people that were OD wow. because they're just not getting the effect that they're looking for based on their current use of the drug. So then that's where you run into and, you know, then that issue of them being able to justify in their minds, you know, it's just like in, in hypertension or diabetes, I get people because they don't feel things or people have this interesting way of ignoring things. You know, they, they ignore they the signs. Yeah, they, they, and they will try to find a way to say, oh, that's not me. I'm not, you know, that may be somebody else. They're running to a problem. I don't have a problem. I have a legitimate issue where I have to take these meds. So, you know, and i tell you, you know, there are times where, you know, dealing with Joe, I I take him any day of the week. <laughs> over, I mean, over some over of these some others, of these, yeah. individuals, because they can be extremely challenging to deal with because of they hide behind that. And I've had people that go from, they shop doctor to doctor, and they'll get, drugs from one doc go to another doc get the same thing fortunately with databases i was gonna say is that know, helping now yeah, because it helps I, know, I know that they take you through uh, if if a doctor prescribes an opioid um medication that they take you through a lot of changes in order to get to actually get the medication in terms of well you can, id and all the yeah, things that you have to do yeah they do that but then they shop pharmacies too you know they'll uh, take a drug go to right a versus walgreen versus cvs but fortunately you know we have databases now that allow you to see if somebody just has something filled you know and, and i mean and i'm gonna tell you i mean i've had even in my practice docs that i know who you know, we'll that they'll call like a pharmacy will call, and because one of them, um, you know, got um, you know, I mean, they will come in and say, okay, I went to like my brother, mm-hmm. who was a primary care doc, and they'll and they'll go to him and try to get something out of him. He'll refuse because he got comments about you know this scenario. So I had a patient actually you know, fussing at me about my brother saying he was being mean to her (laughs) and didn't understand what the issue was. And and so I called my brother up and talked to him about it. He says, you know how many times she really got that feel, you know, going to shopping around to different docs. So I called on the pharmacies because, you know, I needed to find out how I could get that info myself. And they have this database that they will say. And unfortunately, because of what I do, I don't prescribe narcotics much other than post-procedure. But, you know, the other, like, people have to deal. I feel bad for primary care docs because they got to deal with this stuff on a regular basis. Yeah. And it's tough. Yeah. What do you see, Tom? Well, I've, I've worked in a pain management clinic, too, so I understand that whole okay. process. And, and when, the, when the doctor is not giving the patient what they want, the patient, as a, man, a practice manager, they will come to me and say, I'm not an addict. You need to talk to this doctor. Why do they treat me like an addict? 
one of the good things is, as Dr. Newey just said, now we do this physician monitoring program where you can look at the database. And so we have evidence now, or, you know, uh, to, sh to see if a person is doctor shopping. Mm -hmm. And, of course, new regulations have changed, so you just cannot continue to give uh, uh, some pain medicine for folks uh, uh, because um, uh, uh, it, it's a way to try to re reduce the whole opiate addicts. But uh, the, the key is that people continue to take it because, one, first of all, because say if they're in pain or if they're, or if they're doing it just as, uh, as to get high, mm -hmm. is they're trying to get that high again or they're trying to alleviate the pain, so they need to take more. But eventually, and you can ask Joe, is that it's really so they don't get sick. Is the issue is getting sick. It's so bad. So on the one hand, they want more pain medicine to offset uh, pain medication, offset the pain. But after a while, you become addicted. So 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 that sickness, because I, I mean, I've seen shows and, and, mm -hmm. and know people who have been addicted to heroin. And if they don't get it, they get physically sick. But you're saying with the pain meds, yeah. I mean, with uh, pain pills and so forth, that same yeah. kind of sickness. Yeah, it will, because if they can't if they can't alleviate the pain, if the doctor's not going to give them any more, then one of the things they're going to do, they're going to go to the street and mm -hmm. they're going to get the pain medicine from the street or they're going to get heroin. And so it is, it's a vicious cycle. Then on top of that, though, then you got people trying to sell it. Oh, yeah. So, you know, you got yeah. to deal with that group because they come in to get those drugs, not because they want to take them, but they but want to sell them, them on the street yeah. for the money. So, Joe, I mean, did you ever worry about overdosing? No. Did you? That was never a thought in your head. You, you chase that first high. Like you said, your tolerance go up. Mm -hmm. You spend 10 years trying to feel like you felt the first time you used it and you never get it so and so that makes you take it stronger and stronger more and more, more and more, more until until you until wow so and did after, you ever get sick of course and after a while you don't even get high anymore you just get normal so that you can uh, function function do stuff because if, if you don't you can't get out of bed your bowels mm. you're throwing up it's mm. a physical it's a physical physical thing yes yeah, it's, it's tough cause it doesn't take much because some people you know they they say it i you know of course i'm really pulling out pharmacology now but <laughs> i remember there was uh, i remember reading you know way back in medical school about some people that have a, like a almost like a gene for addiction and i i don't know how true that is and i've never reread the data but there are some people that you know just like you hear about cigarettes you know some people can smoke for 40 years and just stop. And just stop. Yep. Cold turkey. Then you have other people. I mean, I'm telling you, take that first puff on that cigarette and they hook for life. There are, I think there is something to be said some, about some that. Something to be said about yeah, genetics. Exactly. And then I think to, to, but the problem is identifying who they are and trying to help, you know, work with them is going to be tough because I'm not sure that they've identified how to determine that. So, okay. So people have in their minds that there is this, you know, the, the typical drug addict. Okay. Um, is somebody from the hood, somebody who's, you know, kind of down in their luck and they they spend their whole day trying to get high and so forth. Then you have this picture of, of the white suburban housewife who now is doing heroin because she can't get the prescription pills anymore. Where is she getting it from, Joe? The streets. So, she, really? You actually have some doctors that they can go to, pain management doctors that literally take money for prescriptions. Wow. It gives bad so it, makes it, very... it, it messes us all up, you know, because we don't want that kind of reputation. Good. I think it's going to be harder to do, but, yeah, yeah it's, it's... with that database now. Yeah, it's going to be harder to do in the future to go to the doctors to do that. Many of those doctors are slowly going out of business because of the new regulations. But you still, you get it from family members. You get it for friends. You go to people's medicine cabinet, and, you know... A lot of folks, if they get medication, maybe they don't use it anymore. They just keep it in their medicine cabinet. So you get it from friends and other neighbors, and you go from there. So you just do whatever you have to do. You do whatever in you a, have In to order to, to right. make it happen. It's yeah. a market for it out there. They, you have dealers that that's all they sell, mm -hmm. appeals. Mm. And so, so we're not talking about the criminal side of this because I think the criminal side yeah. deserves what it deserves, which yeah. is – but but – when you look at the disparity over how particularly young uh, African-American males are arrested for marijuana, for, you know, these lesser drugs, as they call them, um, that, that the system still needs to be fixed. 
Yes, mm-hmm. and I and I do think in some cases we're doing a better job with the law enforcement. Law enforcement is, and it may be because of the change in the uh, color, but law enforcement now are being very helpful. We've over the years we've educated them, so there are there are partners in trying to resolve this problem not only with the opioid okay. epidemic but with other drug and alcohol. I mean, we have drug courts, so the criminal justice system involved in that. Law enforcement officer, if they see somebody that is ODN, of course, they give them the lax, uh, the revived medication, right. and then refer people to treatment services or give them resources. So law enforcement are coming around; they're at the table with us. So there, there are partners right now. Now, I don't know. My perception is, is it that way in all communities? Yeah. I don't know that answer, <clears throat> but they are turning around. They're they're seeing that they cannot lock people up anymore. They have to be involved in a different so way. So you think that, that this new look or this different way of looking at addiction eventually may cross all color lines and may help I'm hoping, all, I'm all hoping. communities? That the would issue be interesting. is going to be that perception of how yeah. they're still treated, though, because if you really think about it, you know, one of the, the biggest issues that still abound in this country is dealing with race relations right. and how people perceive other people. You think about it, you get on an elevator, and as a as a young black man in that elevator versus a young white male, how would that person that gets on the elevator with them perceive either one yeah. individually? Yeah. And that still is an issue. It's so if, if it's an issue there, then it's going to be an issue when you have a young brother coming into court versus a young, uh, you know, Caucasian male and how they're looked at, you know, per by the judge by the court well, system well and, and not only how general. they're looked at but also who has the legal representation yeah. and who doesn't yeah, that's um right. you know and and so forth <laughs> if you're just joining us we're talking about the opioid epidemic and its effect on the African American community with Tony Crisp director of addiction and recovery treatment services with the Hampton Newport News Community Services Board Joe who is a recovering addict and my co-host on another view on health cardiologist Dr. Keith Newby 440 440- Two six six five or one eight hundred nine four zero two two four zero are the numbers to join to call to join our conversation. Let's talk to Seth in Williamsburg. Hi, Seth. You're on the air. Hello. Thank you so much. Uh-huh. Um, great conversation. Um, I would just like to um, the, the comment about chronic pain and the difficulty of treating patients who have that uh, as a genesis or, or justification for their addiction problem. And um, just love to hear thoughts on how the addiction community and the you know medical community are looking at diet as a potential underlying cause of chronic pain through you know digestive issues. And, and I would relate it. I, I'm not African American, but um, I would relate it to potentially African American community through one example of you know lactose intolerance as something that uh, can be more prevalent. Uh, depending on, you know, just the just, uh, community of origin, ethnicity, and so on. Mm-hmm. But there's a whole range of other um, dietary food sensitivities and things like that. So chronic pain and diet, how, how would you, how are you incorporating that um, into the response? Okay, Seth, so thanks so much for the call. I, Tony? I can start off, and Dr. Newby can really, because he's the doctor, I'm not the doctor. <laughs> but working in a pain management clinic, usually a couple of things that they would tell people to do. One, if you're smoking, stop smoking. Because smoking really, it, it, it causes a lot of pain. So if you quit smoking, you can lessen your pain. L- lose weight and exercise, even if you just need to walk. People don't want to do that. <laughs> you know, just walk. They don't want to do that. And then go to physical therapy. Oh, they don't want to do that. But usually stop smoking, exercise, lose weight. And that will lessen the pain. That will lessen the pain. pain. It, it won't go away, but it will. Do, these are the things that will lessen the pain. And then we try to do other educational things from a psychosocial to educate people what they can do in terms of meditation. But uh, that's what I know from a, a manager side. Mm-hmm. So I'm turning it over to the doctor. No, I mean, I think uh, 100% agreement. I mean, there are, I think, ways you deal with it um, are different for different people. But I think this is a society that's become so ingrained to take the easy way out you know so you look at taking a pill pill, then i I don't have to deal with it and unfortunately (laughs) so that that's only and and i tell people all the time all you're really doing if you read what this stuff does it doesn't really 
take away any pain. It's not like an anti-inflammatory drug. It doesn't do any of that. All it's doing is masking the pain. It's changing your perception of the pain that's still there. So when the drug wears off, the pain's still there. It's not going anywhere. And that's why you take more, exactly. more of the drug. To try to keep that going. Absolutely. Let's talk to John in Hampton. Hi, John. You're on the air. Hi, Barbara. Uh, yeah, this is John. Um, I don't really have a comment, but uh, more of a observation. Okay. I have a daughter, 30-year-old daughter, two kids, um, major heroin addict, major. Nice. Um, has lost has lost her kids. Um, has been in and out of jail in Newport News with the uh, uh, county jail system here, um, and has recently got into a program up in Northern Virginia and Alexandria, uh, Friends of Guest House. And I, again, this is more just observation. Mm-hmm. It's it's been pretty amazing just how much, how many people. The more uh, because I'm into obviously intimately involved with what's going on. I see it. Um, just how many people are in this boat? That I, I think the gentleman's name is Joe. Mm-hmm. Uh, the things he talks about, the stories. It just is on and on. Everywhere you turn. I have my father, uh, 76-year-old, goes to the VA, hooked on uh, pain meds. Mm. Just, it, it's just, it's incredible how addictive this stuff is. Stuff is yeah. I have my neighbor uh, has, I believe is, has, is a cancer patient, gets pain meds, and she's selling them out of her house. It's all around us. And just, again, not to prolong this, just observations. John, uh, thanks so much for the call. We do appreciate that, and we wish you the best with your daughter. We hope that, that things oh. work out um, with your family. I know that must be very, very tough. It is, but I just, I'd be interested in hearing what type of, what's the answer to Okay. This problem. All righty. We'll talk about it. Thanks so much for the call. Anybody want to start? I, I, I think it's ongoing education. Tony. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're trying to do that in, from a com- community perspective, uh, getting coalition from different, the health care system, uh, the uh, treatment system, folks like uh, Joe, and being on shows like this. So we got to get the word out to educate, and we got to start e- with the young people. Uh, as you if you heard from Joe, and in many cases, most time people start young with pot, unfortunately, and then now that's being in some places legal. So, so what marijuana. do you think about the legalization? Well, is I that think, an, an, a, a gateway? <clears throat> Let me ask Joe first. Is that okay. is that a gateway? Yes, it is. So, so do you disagree with it with the legalization of marijuana? Or yes, because you you feel that smoking by smoking marijuana, that's going to lead you to go to. It's other a drugs. gateway drug. I, I differ a little bit. I think okay. it should be discrim- uh, the, the criminalized, but for medical purposes. Okay. Uh, but uh, it, it is alcohol and marijuana seem to be the gateway for, you know, that's where it started with young folks. And so we we got to find a way to educate them. Uh, but I do think because law enforcement has been another way to get people in jail. So I feel differently from a medical perspective. I think it should be utilized, uh, but uh, legal, no. You know, we we always talk about drug use as a means to mask pain, to mask emotions, to mask things that are going wrong, and so forth. Are there people who just like to get high? Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but, it's gotta, yeah, but the thing is, it's got to start somewhere. Yeah. And that's where, just because that's why I asked the question of Joe when he first came on, was, you know, seven years old. Yeah. I mean, a seven-year-old yeah. kid does not have the capability. I mean, he sucks. Even adults don't even have that at times. But to differentiate you know, what they're doing, you know, what that's all about. And it's really criminal to me that when it's one thing if you're doing something yourself, but when you introduce somebody else to something, a seven-year-old kid, yeah, right. I mean, that's the part that, <laughs> unfortunately, so until, you know, it really does involve that education, but until we find a way to attack that piece, I mean, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be tough because they'll still have, you know, because think about it, you know, there's a certain group of people that listen to your show. Mm-hmm. Now, are the people that necessarily would be in the neighborhood, like what Joe was talking about, would start off, would they be sitting here listening to this? Probably, maybe, maybe, maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. You know, However, thing, 
if you look at the overall numbers, there are a lot of people who listen to this show that will definitely be affected. Well, I mean, I'm this, saying, but I'm just saying, when you're talking about, about getting to this, to this type, type of, that of type person. of situation right. in right. that specific type community. of yeah mm-hmm. community mm-hmm. where you talk about somebody that's going to expose a seven year old to it. Now, you know, I'm saying adults, different story. But when you talk about that, you know, there's there's a, I mean, I don't know. There's just an inherent issue that how we're raised if we're exposed and i was you know i came up you know i don't know if you remember I, you're you're not are you, are you from here i'm from baltimore, baltimore that's right that's right <laughs> you know back in oh, when i was bad. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. when yeah. i was when i was growing up here there was a neighborhood lafayette shores that at the right. time i was growing up lafayette shores yeah, it was not the lafayette not, shores that it is today, today. <laughs> and, and i hung out in there quite a bit and i was around people using drugs a lot you know and i was exposed i was 12 you know years old seeing people smoking weed and stuff all the time fortunately you know i didn't you know i, I knew my mom would kill me you know, <laughs> literally uh you know but that was uh you know that was an exposure that you would see on a regular basis and this and i ain't gonna tell my age but it was a while ago you know so at that time if you're seeing that then you know i mean imagine the exposure now and, yeah. and how do you delve into that is our phone problem. lines are lit up let's, <laughs> let's talk to david in suffolk hi david you're on the air hi um it's so much to talk about you guys hit on so many subjects um i wanted to, i wanted to ask a question and and uh make a comment uh, the question is is there anything uh going on right now focused directly on the disparities and the sentencing um, of uh, black and brown folks mm. uh, to the rest of the, of society, and uh, the other thing I want to speak on was um, I'm a recovering addict, and uh, during the the time uh, during my my whole addiction, ninety percent of that time uh, was used uh, rather than trying to get high. I I, I was more focused on not getting sick and uh all the the drug addicts that i hung around uh seemed to be focused on just that thing i don't think nobody was as focused on getting high as they were uh trying to avoid getting sick okay david let's let uh, joe respond thanks so much for the call that, you, that, you you responded on both points that he made that that's very true because after a while you you don't even get high anymore it's just you just want to be normal. So, yeah, we spent a lot of time trying not to be sick because you can't do nothing. So when, you, when you say, you know, trying to be normal, when you're sick, what does that feel like? Is it nausea? You say throwing up? What? what is Everything. It? Your Everything. body just break down like the worst case flu you ever okay. had. Okay. Oh, I okay. could not get out of the bed. Okay. I couldn't do nothing. I don't care what happened. The house could be on fire. I'm going to burn. Heard that. Okay, Patrice joins us from Chesapeake. Hi, Patrice. You're on the air. Hi. I had a two-part question. The The first is, because I've had critical illness um, and was prescribed, like, 90 pills of, like, Vicodin. And um, I guess it, I was told that that was just so I wouldn't have to come back. But you get to a point where, because you want to avoid the pain, you you kind of can't distinguish when you should stop taking the pain medicine and just deal with the pain because they say take it before the pain gets really bad. But if you're trying to wean off the opioids, you you kind of don't want to feel the pain, so you just want to keep taking the medicine. And it's hard to distinguish when not to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, the other part of my question is um, a lot of parents, I don't think they they can identify when when kids are dealing with a drug issue versus a mental issue. And um, I recently ran into that with a a child that I know, and I thought that they were having a mental breakdown. And when the cops showed up, they were like, the person is high. And I was like, it never came to my mind because I never ran into it before. So how do you distinguish these two things if you're not brought up in an urban environment where you're exposed to that? Okay, thanks so much, Patrice, for the call. How do you tell if your child is addicted or taking drugs? Uh, I, I think it's hard, but it's, some, it's, it's looking at the physical thing. You look at some of the social thing. When 
things like is he's associating with different people mm-hmm. or the grace beginning to fall those kind of things and there, you, there are some physical traits but i don't know but mainly it's is the whole uh social socialization kind of thing okay. and changes in behavior mm-hmm. yeah. changes in behavior. change change Any Ch- change in his behavior yeah I mean, they start seeing somebody get irritable a lot more than they right. normally would. I mean, you know, especially as a pattern. I mean, I've found in medicine everything is about patterns. What do you see when you start seeing things go a certain way? You have to take that in consideration. Something may be ongoing. But that's where a parent has to really get right. involved. And a lot of parents seem like they're not. Yeah, so, unfortunately so. Okay. There are also places okay. they can go to get educated mm-hmm. about, you know, about that issue. Such as? Which um, they go? Al Anon. Okay. Different um meetings. Okay. You know, twelve step meetings. And they can learn, you know, behave about behaviors and addiction and all that. It's, it's very helpful. Okay. Mark joins us from Williamsburg. Hi Mark, you're on the air. Hey, how you doing today? Okay. Uh I w- I just wanted to make a comment on a question you uh asked earlier. Uh huh. People just like getting high. I'm, I'll answer that question. If you go to Applebee's or Roof Chris or somewhere tonight, <laughs> you know, people are sitting there drinking all night. So why are they look that different than a, a drug addict? You know, I, I just think it's just very unfair the way the category they put drug users in. And then this thing about the hood, people are acting like people who grew up in the hood are some drug experts. I mean, it's not, we're not, people weren't in the hood because they wanted to be in the hood. That was just their circumstance. So they're not experts on drugs. Uh, and this epidemic has been around. It's been an epidemic in our community since so I was born. I was born in 63. Mm-hmm. Well, I've lost family members to drugs all through the na- and friends through the neighborhood. But nobody ever cared. They just stuck us in the ghetto or some low-income communities where society didn't have to deal with us. Mm-hmm. It's only an epidemic because it creeped into other neighborhoods. You know that they didn't want it in. You know other mm-hmm. neighbors that they didn't want it in. But a fact that uh, a person's child, a white child, is going through it and in and out of jail. Well, we don't know nothing about in and out of jail. We just in jail. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't get to come back and forth like they do. And then my last point: the discrepancy in the legal system with the brown people and the white people. Mm. It's never going to change if. 90% of the police force is white. You think he's going to lock his kids up opposed to your kids? And all the judges, are, most of the judges are white? Are they, you think they're going to put their kids and grandkids in jail opposed to your kids? The system is white, so those are the ones they're going to spare. So it's just like if the system was black, more white people would be getting arrested. We have biases in us that are just natural that you can't fight, and that's what it's about. you got to get some equality in the system. The, the police force in a black neighborhood needs to start looking a little like the neighborhood, not just all white cops in a black neighborhood. They can't identify with that neighborhood. Mark, you've said a mouthful. So let us <laughs> let us see if we can unpack some of this. Um, and I really appreciate your call. One of the points that Mark brings up is that, and, and it, people are talking about the fact that the African-American community does not have the political clout that other communities have. Therefore, that's why there was no, you know, commission started by the pres- by by um, Nixon. You know, instead he decided let's lock them up. You know, so so if you don't have that political clout, also that becomes an issue in terms of treatment. Well, Would you agree well, or well, disagree? Well, you know that really, to be honest with you, that should be irrelevant. It you should know, be it, irrelevant. It should be irrelevant. It- I know, but it's not. But it should be. I mean, if you get busted with an ounce of coke in your pocket. If the law is the law and it says this is what you get, then that should be what you get. You know, now, I mean, there could be extenuating circumstances, but the bottom line is it still should be within a range for everybody. You know, we know that's not the reality, but that's where, to me, if you did that, that's going to eliminate all that. You don't have to worry about political clout. But we know the justice system doesn't work that way. But that's where I look. But at the it. justice system and treatment. I yeah. mean, mm-hmm. because I, I, you tell me, Tony, when the crack cocaine was at its highest, what kind of treatment were people getting, and was it equivalent to what's going on now? No, it was not partially because uh, it, we didn't know as much. But mainly, it was you know, it was a black in their mind it was a black issue, not a white issue, because it was the rock versus the powder. Uh, and there's also the amount of resources. So, and then it, it was the legal system was locking them up, and for the women was taking taking away their kids, mm-hmm. 
and the issue was on uh, you know the welfare and 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 and, and uh, putting people to work. So it was a different it was a different time, but it was always it was a seen as a black problem, not a, a not an American problem. It was a okay. black problem. Heather joins us from Virginia Beach. Hi, Heather. You on the air? Yes, Barbara. Um, I appreciate all these social justice concerns, and there definitely is a color divide about who succeeds and who doesn't. Um, but back to the opioid, which I really think should not be being prescribed. Any opiate for pain needs to stop being prescribed. The pharmaceuticals need to stop um, pushing them because of the highly addictive nature. And there was an article about the Staten Island first responders who all required painkillers and their children and also they um, were dying at huge numbers because of their addictions and the children especially going out and getting heroin and dying and a priest on Staten Island was saying, why am I burying all these young people? Um, it is a highly addictive substance. People are in genuine physical pain, as well as psychological trauma for, from 9-11 or any kind of first responder. Um, but pain needs to be managed in a very different way, rather than anyone prescribing these opioid-based um, pain killers because the the it will end up in death for most people. And that's why people can't get the prescription anymore. They're desperate. They don't want to be feel deathly ill. So they go for the heroin. The heroin is toxic because it's being laced with all kinds of toxins and people are dying by the droves. It's sad that it has become a national epidemic. People really are um, dying from this. Okay, Heather, thanks so much for the call. Go I think ahead. it has to be a balanced approach. Uh, folks need the medication, but it, we try to do it from, you You have the medication, but you also have to participate in counseling services, the psychosocial kind of thing. Mm -hmm. The whole disease is a biopsychosocial disease. I mean, so you, you can't got, just, just you cure just, it just yeah. by taking a, a different kind of drug. Yeah, and, or not taking drugs or at all. Drugs you know, at it's all. a combination. You got to deal with the physical from the biological, you got to do the psychological with the counseling, and then people that resources, social work, home, housing. So medication alone doesn't work, but just counseling alone for somebody that's an open addict sometimes don't work either. So it's a combination. Okay. Mary joins us from Virginia Beach. Hi, Mary. You're on the air. Hi. Thank you. One of your guests talked about maybe decriminalizing marijuana. We know marijuana can be a gateway drug. Uh, we've been dealing with this for decades. Tony knows this. Um, but nice. I've done some research. The ACLU did some research and found that African Americans are four times more likely than whites to be arrested for marijuana. And in states mm -hmm. like Washington, they um, legalize recreational use of marijuana in part to kind of correct these social injustices. But still, African Americans are getting arrested three times more likely. So it gets back to the issue one of your guests said. We've got to do a lot more work in terms of you know, typecasting, stereotyping, et cetera. We just can't decriminalize certain substances without looking at the broader context. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, looking at Mary, it from a medical, it. medical perspective, when I was thinking of discriminating, but I want to look at it from, you know, use it as a, a medical perspective, so mm -hmm. just not, mm -hmm. not just for recreation. So, but the point we want to make is that drug addiction crosses all socioeconomic, right. all racial lines. And so it's not just African Americans who get caught up in, in, in becoming addicted, Joe. Is that you right? Ju you just hear about us. You don't hear about the white people that's addicted, that's out there still. It's like their stuff is swept under the rug. You know, they even in jails and in prison, mm -hmm. if you go in there, nine out of every ten black person is locked up behind drugs in one form or another, selling or trying to get or using, mm -hmm. you know. And <clears throat> the racial thing is so bad. In jails, we don't even have, you don't even have white guys in there with, with us. It's like segregated in there. You may have one, you know, here and there, but it's 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 terrible. Did you go to jail? Have a you few been? times. A few times. Prison. For, for, for drug, drug use. Drug use. Okay. Let's. Um, I think we got time for one more call. Josephine joins us from Newport News. Hi, Josephine. You're on the air. Hi, this is Josephine, 
And I was just calling to piggyback off of what Joe said. And I just wanted to reiterate, uh, drugs don't have a name on it, so it doesn't matter where you're from, where you live, whether you have two parents in the home or not. Um, I'm Joe's sister. <laughs> Hello? Uh, we came from a good home, so drugs don't have a name. Um, it's just up to the individual who decides to make the choice to try, and then the outcome may be good or bad. Okay, thank you so very much, Josephine. I appreciate that. What, you want to respond? Which is very true because doing some work on myself, I found out that I was an addict way before I picked up because of my behaviors. Mm. The drugs is just a symptom of your disease. Your disease shows up in different areas of your life, sex, food, um, um, shopping, whatever. Mm -hmm. Anything I do and it brings me joy, I overdo it. Oh, and it causes okay. a problem in my life, in some area of my life. So, yeah, I, I had both parents. I had everything. The... All the latest shoes, clothes. My father ran a business. I came up in that business, had both parents. It was just choices that I made. That you made. So you're doing better today? Of you're doing okay today? Yes, ma'am. Good. You look good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So we've got about two minutes left. Um, just one last piece of advice from each of you for somebody who may be struggling with an addiction or may, may be trying to figure out if they are addicted. What would you tell them, Jeff? There is help out there. Um, ask questions, call people, call here. I'm sure you, you yes, can get can in contact with one of us. Just, it, there is help. Okay. There is help. Okay. That's Joe of Recovering Addict, and we appreciate you being on the show today. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Tony. Uh, the same thing. Uh, there is help out there. Uh, I can just say from Hampton Newport News Community Services Board, we have expanded our services to really deal with not only the opioid problem, but just drug and alcohol issues as a whole and then I think the community uh, is really beginning to focus on this and there's a lot of correlation trying to fight this problem. That is so. Tony Crisp and he is the Director of Addiction and Recovery Treatment Services with the Hampton Newport News Community Services Board. Thank you Tony so very much for being with us and Dr. Keith Newby <laughs> you got the last minute. All right well I would just say the key thing is just recognition that you know you have a problem you're gonna have you know I think all of us have to just sometimes take a step back and, and just look and re-examine our lives and see where we are with things. If you can identify and willing to see that you may have an issue, I think the that's that's the first, always the first step, then you can really legitimately seek help. So that would be always say, take a minute, reevaluate. Thank you so very much, Dr. Keith Newby, and we'll see you next month. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. want to let you guys know that we will be bringing you the story of uh, musician and actor Michael Jamil next week. Our conversation was going so well, we wanted to make sure we got as many calls in as we possibly could. Lots to ponder on the information we shared on today's show. If you want to hear it again or share it with a friend, visit our website, anotherviewradio.org. Next week, a new look at an age-old problem to spank or not to spank. But I guarantee you've never looked at the issue from this perspective. Arthur Stacy Patton begs us to spare the kids. Our theme music was composed and performed by Jay Sennett. Lisa Godley is our show producer. Victor Bowen is our audio engineer. And Todd Smith answered our phones. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Thank you so very, very much for listening to Another View. <laughs>